are on their way. Uh, so. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, I'll just spend a couple of minutes giving Jake some time. Um, Jake is uh, an extremely interesting person. He's a man of many talents and many experiences. Uh, he might be the only person in recorded history to have published security research, uh, to have worked on uh, pornography websites, and to have debated the State Department and partied with members of the Icelandic Parliament. And all of these different things have been in the service of making the world a safer, more just, and more beautiful and fun place to be. So I think we're all really happy to have him here. Uh, his first, I think it was his first piece of published security research, you can correct me if I'm wrong, was like eight years ago um, with a professor named Ed Felton where they discovered that if you take the memory chips out of computers and you freeze them with cold spray right away, you can actually recover a lot of the information that was in your sort of RAM memory on the computer well after the computer's been turned off. And I think in the eight years since, Jake has discovered that governments don't have to do anything quite as draconian in order to get everything that you have on your computer and then transfer over the internet. So now he's going to tell you all about that and how to avoid it. Thanks, Jake. Thanks. Um, okay, I think I'm ready. So thanks for having me. Um, I'm going to if anybody has any questions, like I said, just basically just raise your hand and I'll try to call on you as soon as I possibly can. I really hate this format for having a discussion. Like in that I prefer to sit in a circle and have people share things and have a discussion, but since this is how it's been framed and there's all these cameras, I guess we'll do it this way. So just pretend we're in that circle and then make that circle overlaid in this weird reality. Um, so basically I work for a group, it's called the Tor Project. It's a 501c3 nonprofit out of Massachusetts, and I do software development for Tor, and I also do advocacy and training. So technically, my work here today is basically sponsored by Tor, though I didn't tell them I was gonna be here. I don't want to tell mine. Um, I also work at the University of Washington, which is technically a state institution, um, which is kind of like a strange thing, but I thought it would be really great when federal agents came and bothered me, that I could like, tell them not to bother me, and say, hey, I work for the Washington state government, it never actually happened, so I don't know. <laughs> um, so I mean, I have these kind of two hats. One where I do security research at the University of Washington and in general a tour, and then I also actually care about the effects. So some scientists, what they actually do is they just think of things. And I think it's important to actually implement those things and make them useful, and to do it for a reason, right? So it's not just the advancement of science and knowledge. It's also the advancement of science and knowledge in a practical sense for everybody so with Tor, the idea is that every person has the right to read and the right to speak freely with no exceptions. Every person, no exceptions, right? And the immortal words of Bill Hicks there. And so Tor creates that by having a, a free software program that every person can install. It gives them access to what we would call an anonymity network. So someone in the audience asked about so-called secure proxies. I don't know who that was, but um, Tor is, in a sense, a secure proxy for certain definitions of secure. The idea is that someone can watch you at your house, going in and out of your house. You know, probably everyone's familiar with the policeman sitting across the street from their house and watching them. And they write down every person that goes in and every person that goes out and they take photographs of that. Is everyone here familiar with that concept? Just the way the police surveil people? We call that traffic analysis, right? And what they're doing at a house is they're doing the analysis of the traffic going in and out of a person's house. They do the same thing with your internet connection. Only they see that you're going to Google. They see that you're going to rise up. They see this stuff by watching your internet connection. In the case of AT&T, for example, they give up this data wholesale to the US government, probably through the NSA. Mark Klein has talked a lot about this, and the Electronic Frontier Foundation, EFF.org, is covering this issue a lot, and they're litigating against the government. So this means that they are watching your house all of the time, essentially on the internet but they're watching your house through your internet connections. So you may also be surveilled at your front door, but this kind of data collection is something that can happen automatically, and in many cases it does happen automatically. Sometimes for billing purposes, other times it happens because you're actually specifically targeted. Uh, on Democracy Now! last Friday, and also on, on Monday, I was on there with an ex-NSA agent who was in the agency for 40 years, and like to be at the same table with that guy was really an amazing experience. I've sort of always wanted to have that happen. And what he said was that basically the NSA spies on the United States. And like when a guy who's been at the NSA for 40 years comes on to democracy now to tell you that that is happening, you know that you're really fucked. I mean, that's a really serious problem. Like it's one that can't be ignored. So knowing that they're doing that kind of spying, first thing, 
Anybody here that has the illusion that they're not being monitored, I would like you to raise your hand. Okay, by the end of this meeting, I hope that I will convince you that you should not raise your hand again when someone says that. <laughs> and, you know, not to pick on anybody, right? I mean, really it's important to note, we have built a surveillance state, the likes of which the Stasi, in some ways, I think, could not compete with, right? Recontextualize Facebook and think of it as Stasi book. All your friends reporting on you all the time. Interesting problem, right? And, and there are reasons why it's so socially successful. When you combine that with warrantless wiretapping and targeted warrant approved, whether FISA warrant or other warrant approved wiretapping, you get a crazy reality, right? So for example, in the case that's happening right now against me, the US government has almost certainly received all of my banking records, all of my phone records, all of my internet traffic, all of my emails, maybe even the contents of all my emails, and tons of other metadata about me. And the way they did that was by asking companies for the logs they just had sitting around, and then asked them to keep new logs moving forward. So the scary thing is that if you're sitting in this room, you're close to me. And if I'm under that kind of scrutiny, the way that their investigation works is that they look at the people that I talk to, or that anybody under investigation is talking to, and they link them. So did anybody see on the subway, link your metro card to your debit card, yeah. right? And like auto refill? This is the concept which is key to everything we'll talk about today. It's called linkability. Take one piece of data and link it to another piece of data. So everybody here is probably familiar, but I'll sort of go back a little bit to some simple stuff. But um, in a graph, you have essentially some different things. So for example, if you have your metro card and you have your debit card, you have those things and you can draw a line between them. Right? So we could talk about this in terms of edges and vertices, but for simplicity's sake, we just say, you have a graph, and there are two items, and they're linked together. So that's like not a scary thing, except your bank card is maybe tied to everything else that you do during the day. So now they know where you're going, when you make purchases. And in theory, you should have some protection for these things. But the government has consistently said that you actually have no protection, and you have no assumption of privacy. So when they decide to target you, they can actually recreate your exact steps with a metro card and with, with a credit card alone. Like literally where you go and what you buy, and potentially by linking that data with other people on similar travel plans, they can figure out who you talk to and who you met with. When you then take cell phone data, which logs potentially your location, and in the cases where you're already targeted, they actively ask the cell phone company for your location in real time, say every 15 minutes, and you link up purchasing data metro card data and your debit card, you start to get what you could call metadata in aggregate over a person's life. And metadata in aggregate is content. It tells a story about you, which is made up of facts, but is not necessarily true. So for example, just because you were on the corner and all those data points point to it, it doesn't mean you committed a crime. But when the FBI has all this data, their job is to take that data and make it tell a story where they control the narrative. So if they have the ability to retroactively capture that data, you have a pretty big problem, right? Because the incentives are all lined up against you. And their job is to ruin your life, whoever you are. So that's the good news. <laughs> you have a question? Uh, how many people added this event to their Google Calendar? <laughs> At the yeah. bottom of the web page describing it, it said for instructions on how to add yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, in some senses, I, I think it's important to not become paralyzed by this information, right? So it's one thing to know that it's happening, and it's another thing to pretend that the solution is to become a Luddite, right? I mean, we live in a world where technical literacy is as important as fluency in English or another native language. It's okay if we don't have that technical literacy, but we need to have at least some knowledge about it, and we need to understand the way that these systems are used against us, even if we don't understand every little technical detail. Like you don't need to be a physicist to know you need to wear a seatbelt to stay safe in a car. Right? And, and it, it's, it's, it's key to know that adding this to your Google Calendar, who knows if that makes you a suspect or not. The, the thing to consider is, of course, if you don't add it to your Google Calendar, do you really believe that that means none of this stuff is going to happen to you? Right? There are systemic problems here which are on the same level as this, the rest of the social justice issues that Occupy Wall Street cares about. So for example, right now, there's a bill called CISPA, supposedly for cybersecurity and national security of the United States. 
And basically what it does is it takes all the stuff that I'm talking about and it makes it legal. Which means no more warrants for getting data. Companies can get all of your data and hand it over to the US government. It sets a statute of limitation where if there's co-intel prototype operations, you would only have two years to sue. If you don't find out within two years, you can't sue. Right? If this passes and becomes law, it basically gets rid of all the wiretapping rules. It undoes the FISA court stuff that the church committee created. So this stuff is really relevant. But even if we lose that legal battle, which we probably will according to the ACLU, Obama may veto it, he says, but he also said he would veto NDAA, right? And close Guantanamo, and the, I mean, we should really have a toast to all the things he said he would do that he didn't do. Um, um, you know, it's the bricks. But, so the NSA and CISPA and SOPA-like things, these are pretty serious problems. But there are some other ones. For example, the FBI has a tool that's called the National Security Letter. Have any of you guys heard of this? Okay, so here's the deal with NSL. The FBI says that they have an interest in a piece of data for terrorism reasons or whatever. Anybody here seen the NYPD counterterrorism shirts that NYPD people wear? Okay, so the FBI says that they have some reason to, 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 to go after someone for terrorism reasons. Out of, from I think 2003 to 2006, there was like 160,000 or some, some number, really large number of NSL cases. And the Electronic Frontier Foundation has written about this. Of all of those cases, only one of them resulted in a terrorism conviction. So by and large, NSLs are used for non-terrorism related things. And the history of the FBI is basically one of murdering people of color and oppressing people in any minority group. So if we look at the cross-section of that, we see that the FBI not using it for terrorism reasons, is, it, you know, it, it doesn't bode well. So the thing about an NSL is it basically has no potential for judicial review because it comes with a gag. So Google gets one of these potentially. And when Google gets the NSL, they can't tell you they received it. They may be able to contest it in court, but it's actually not clear. It depends on the type of order that is given by the FBI. So in theory, it is possible for a national security letter to go to a company to get all of your data, all the content of everything you're doing. And you will have no idea that it's happening, and you'll have no ability to challenge it. So this is a pretty serious problem, right? So that's, that's like not a secret covert thing. This is what the FBI acknowledges in public. So now you know that if you're targeted as part of Occupy Wall Street, for example, if they're doing 160,000 of them, and there's like 10,000 Occupy Wall Street people, like that's not like a significant number of people to monitor by comparison. All it requires is an FBI agent to say, I think this is worth doing, and then it's done. No questions asked. Now, a company might try to fight that in court, but you may never find out about it. For example, I think it's possible that there's an NSL for me and for one of my accounts. So I actually use Gmail specifically as a, a tactical maneuver to get Google's legal team to fight legal battles for me for free. And I thought that if they ever did it, then I might find out and it would save me like millions of dollars that I'll never have. And it seems to be working out so far, even though we're losing, right? In that we are learning slowly but surely what fascists these people are. And that's a, that's a really useful thing. So if you're willing to try to make that kind of sacrifice, or you're willing to try to you know, basically use these services for that reason, you can, you can do that. But if you know that this is possible, you can also just choose to use services that are not susceptible to these legal threats. For example, if you use Rise Up, you might be susceptible to these threats in theory because they're based in the US. As far as I know, they never received a single NSL. But you could also use a webmail provider, for example, in Sweden or in Germany, and they're not susceptible to a national security letter. But you're, of course, susceptible to an attack between you and reaching that, that provider. So there's some, some things you have to decide about, but using different jurisdictions might actually be very powerful for you if you're worried about these kinds of attacks, will we fix the legal system if it's possible so that these things can't be done without judicial process? And I mean, it's also possible that judicial process isn't enough anyway, because lots of things happen with judicial process that are totally fucked. Um, but another thing to concern yourself about judicial process is a so-called uh, 2703D notice. So this is a, a metadata notice. So someone here asked about metadata. So um, the IP address of every place you log in from allows them to do location tracking. So if you log into Twitter from here and you log into Twitter from home, 
when you log into Twitter from your mobile phone and you're down at Zuccotti Park, you have maybe nothing to worry about because you feel like everything you're doing is fine. And maybe you do that every single day, except the day that there's an action, and you just like don't do that at all. But what you've just done is you've just created an anomaly in the data trail that you leave behind. And that anomaly maybe tells a story about you which you really don't want someone to tell. Maybe not because you were in the action, but because the action occurred at all. And you don't want someone to know that you even had knowledge of that. Maybe that you saw it, because you don't want to be forced into being a witness. So the 2703 deorder, the thing that's really scary about it is that it just requires, and it's someone in it basically administratively to issue this. That's called an administrative subpoena. It is less than a search warrant, and so it doesn't get the content, say, of your direct messages on Twitter or sites like this, but it gets all the metadata about those messages. So who sent who, what, IP addresses you came from, and so on. So it's extremely effective for doing location tracking, again, without a warrant. And the US government effectively asserts that because you disclose this information to a third party, which is how the entire world works, is through so-called third parties, um, they say that you have no expectation of privacy. So it's pretty bogus. We're fighting this in court, but we're in the rocket docket, which is the Fourth Circuit, which is like the least friendly possible federal court system that you could possibly be in. And so, like, sad to say it, we're not probably going to do so well. And actually, Twitter has had to disclose this data about me, right? And they're using this as part of their WikiLeaks prosecution. So the thing to know is that I am not the isolated incident. I mean, they've got a surprise in store for them when they get that data, but that's a separate discussion. <laughs> But uh, I mean, it's, it's important to, to know about these things. So that's the super technical legal stuff from someone who is definitely not a lawyer, and certainly not your lawyer, and certainly not all y'all lawyers. Right? <laughs> so that's a lot to take in. So we can always take a deep breath and stand up. Everybody stand up. OK. If you're not standing up, get the fuck out of the room. <laughs> Come on, stand up. Seriously, just stand up. Be with us. Be one of us. Participate. Okay. The shit's really boring, and I'm really sorry about it, but we have to learn about it. Okay. Everybody sit down. Sorry. Um, okay. So, let's recontextualize all the stuff that we have in our life. Raise your hand if you have a cell phone. Okay. Raise your hand if you have a tracking device. Probably. Right on. 100% intersection with the people that raise their hands. Right. Every person that raised their hand for having a cell phone should raise their hand for having a tracking device. All the legal measures I just mentioned, those, when you put them together, cell phones become tracking devices that also make phone calls, right? That also make internet connections. So here's the bad news about that. In addition to being tracking devices, the US government has software that they can deploy to your telephone, in some cases by breaking into the phone, but in other cases by pushing updates to the telephone. And when they do that, it allows them to take complete control of your telephone. Activate the microphone, activate the camera, all this stuff, pull your address book, pull all the data from your phone remotely. If they take your phone in person, they do a thing that's called forensics, right? So it's like any kind of forensics process. They look at the device, they image the device. So if they looked at a crime scene, they would take photos and like note everything about it and they would report factual information. Some phones do better than others when it comes to forensics. It depends, really, is what it comes down to. If they get your phone and you don't know that you're secure, or you don't think you're secure in any way, you're not. That's pretty much the baseline, right? So if you're carrying around a telephone and it doesn't have a password on it, and when you when you lock the screen, for example, they'll plug in a device that's called a Cellbrite device. And this company originally started doing like police and military forensics of devices. And you can write that down, Cellbrite. Um, they moved on to doing backups of people's telephones. So now they have like you know products that they sell to phone companies, and when you go to a phone store, you plug your old phone into the Cellbrite device, and it transfers all your data to your new phone. Well, the reason that that's possible at all is because these devices can read all the data on your phone. So if you can go to a phone store, you can sometimes get access to these Cellbrite devices, and you can say, I'd like to migrate all my data to this new phone, and if it migrates, then I'll, you know, I'll buy this new phone. And you can test to see if the migration works. And it's pretty much identical. It's not one for one. But it's pretty much identical to some of the simple forensic techniques that they use on telephones. So that's also like a kind of carpet bagging way to get access to forensics devices without having to buy them. <laughs> right? So you know, go to an AT&T store and say, I have this phone, and I want to transfer my data to my new phone. Can you guys do that? Do you have one of these cell-right backup devices? 
And if they do, like, you can actually test yourself right on the spot. And I think it might be hard to find a place that has this, but it shouldn't be impossible. Um, and of course, at the end, if you actually do you know, transfer the data, well, uh-oh, they've got a copy too. Yeah. So, um, so, that's, I mean, so that's a pretty big problem, I think. So you have to recontextualize your <coughs> smartphones to kind of think about it as being this niche in your pocket. Right? So it is a microphone, it is a camera potentially, it has all your phone book data. And that sort of leads to another problem, which is that even if you have a secure telephone, every time you call someone, you disclose the number to the telephone company. And the US government is certain that <coughs> when you disclose that number to the telephone company, you don't have an expectation of privacy about the number you called. So in 2001, they, they actually they actually gave, according to Bill Binney on Democracy Now! on Friday, AT&T actually gave the long distance billing records of all Americans, including every member of Congress, every investigative journalist, every human rights worker, all those people, all their long distance billing records went to the NSA. And they continue to give that data. Yeah, I believe that he said that on national television. So and a guy from the NSA is saying that. So here's the deal. You put all that into a graph and you build links. Remember the links we were talking about with the Metro card? And you do that for all the people in the United States. So what Bill Binney did is build those graphs for all the people in the United States. And he built software to do it for banking transactions, telephone records, internet traffic, and all this stuff. And then you take that data and you stack it up and you find a person and you draw a line between all of those data points and you just built a model of a person's entire life. So when you're using a cell phone to communicate with people, you are helping them to draw those graphs. And wherever there are intersections with lots of people, you have essentially a hub of communication, for example. And you can find, using just, this is traffic analysis, you can just find the, the, the important people, and then they know who to put lots of physical surveillance on and to really target directly. So for a lot of things, it's useful to have a cell phone. I have three on me right now, for example. Most of them are off. But this, you know, there's no question about this. But knowing that that's the threat is important. Because if they rely on this data trail, then that means taking a cell phone and building a pattern with it and leaving it at home when you go out to do something, your cell phone tells an absolutely different story about what you did. And that might be useful. Maybe. And you have to sort of contextualize this and decide for yourself. Because often it is more important to be able to effectively watch cops who are committing police brutality with a cell phone camera than it is to worry about someone knowing you're there. So it's not a question of having it or not having it. It's a question of consciously choosing what you're going to do based on your risks, but also understand it's exactly almost a one-to-one -one map with other transitive risks. So for example, does anybody remember the 80s where there was a big AIDS scare that was pretty scary for a lot of people and they ran these campaigns? about how people have to know that they have a responsibility to be safe, and there's a big safe sex campaign. Well, we don't have that for the surveillance state because it is in the benefit of the surveillance state for us to not be aware of that. But we have the same transit of risks. When you communicate with people, you get yourself added to these graphs. You're all in the graph, but then you get links to people in the graph. And the more links you build, the more important you become in that graph, and the more important, the more resources they dedicate to targeting you. Everybody follow with that? That's some really scary shit. So we have to come up with things that are like condoms, essentially. Because if we don't do that, and we continue to engage, we have this big risk problem. And we're not mitigating the risk at all. Now, obviously, some people would advocate for abstinence, but like I'm a realist, and I know that abstinence doesn't work. So we have to figure out how to do it safely, right? We have to still figure out how to engage. It's an open question. Right? So you guys are actually, in a sense, the canaries in the coal mine, you, you know, as much as I am for some of these legal things. So just keep in mind that what happens to you guys, for example, with fingerprints and retinal scans and photographs, that is what is going to happen to people in the future when people resist the regime in the United States, when they resist policy changes and when they try to protest in a totally constitutionally protected way. But what happens when that model includes your iris scan and your thumbprints? What happens is that it becomes really difficult for you to ever get out of anything. For example, they pull you over, they identify you, they pull all that data up at once. That's what things like CISPA want to be able to do. They want to be able to get all the companies and all the government agencies to be able to put that data into one place 
and to correlate it, and to give it basically access to many people for so-called national security reasons, right? This like specter. So it's important to note that if that is occurring, every time you give up your ID, you give up more data points. Every time you give up a fingerprint, you do that. And it becomes very difficult also to escape from yourself. Because when someone has a perception of you having done a thing, it will now follow you for the rest of your life. And what's really scary is that when you give up enough behavioral data about yourself, they can determine who you are based on just your behaviors alone, even if you use anonymization technologies. For example, there's an attack called stylometry. It's actually an entire field of attacking anonymity. And there's a program called Anonymous Mouth, which you should all write down. What it allows you to do is to try to defeat stylometry. And what stylometry is, in short, is forensic analysis of handwriting to detect patterns. And those patterns identify you uniquely. You use the serial comma, you don't use the serial comma. You like semicolons, you don't like semicolons. You use this verb a lot, you don't use this verb a lot. You're very dark and brooding in your writing. They extract all of these things, they get enough information about you. It turns out that when you write the next blog post, even if you write it under the name anonymous, you're not actually, because the words you use and the choices, the grammar choices you make, those give up your identity. And there are commercial software packages sold as so-called law enforcement, whatever that means, and they do this kind of stylometry. And Anonymous is a tool to help you to anonymize your writing style, to remove those signatures from your actual writing. And it's an experimental project from, I think it's from Drexel University? I can spell that. Like Anon, uh, and then the word mouth. And um, yeah, there was a talk at the Chaos Communications Congress last December about this by the person that, that created it. So, so this is kind of an example, like if we start with all the data analysis and we look at it and we say, okay, a lot of stuff is being recorded. Okay, so everybody in this room, who thinks that they're important? Like what they're doing attracts attention. And who thinks that they're not important? Let's start with who's not important. Right, like the police are never gonna crack down on you and stuff. Okay, cool. So here's the thing, what happens when each one of you has an incident where like a police officer decides that they're important? What happens is they can retroactively go back and look at all of this, pull out this information from data retained about you, and that is a, that's a pretty bad thing. So what we want to do is we want to make as much of that data worthless as possible, and we want to make it so that when they have some worthless data, it's either the wrong data or it's data that you can say, no, no, that's the wrong data. You can say, oh no, I assert my right to privacy. Or they record data and they don't get the content of the thing that you're writing. And because what you post online is anonymized to some extent, either technically or through this linguistic anonymization technique, it means that all the data that they have is kind of, it's, it's, it's worth a lot less. Now, in some ways that might make you suspect, some would say. And some would say, well, it takes a lot of effort and you know it's just too much work and I want to be able to organize. Those are totally valid things. Just the same way when a white man in privilege tells you that he doesn't want to wear a condom. It's totally valid. You decide if you want to engage with that guy. I think that guy's an asshole. I don't work with assholes, right? I don't want to work with people that put me at risk. So you have to decide if you want to work with people that put you at risk, and you have to know that it is a risk because the police are doing these things, right? And I really like this sort of AIDS mapping thing that can be done with that, although I think a lot of people don't like it. But I, I think it's really important because in a totalitarian state, like in Syria, for example, what they do with this kind of traffic analysis information is they shell a city. Right? Those people can talk about being innocent all day long until they no longer can talk because they've been shelled to death. I don't know that that kind of stuff will happen here. I don't really think that it won't happen here. But I think that what we know about the FBI is it doesn't have to get to shelling for your life to be really unpleasant. So the less they can ever get about you, the better. In fact, the less they have about you, the more it is true that you don't have to run faster than the bear. You just have to run faster than the FBI agent that thinks he's hunting bears. Right? I mean, I'm not really good at analogies when I don't sleep. But you get the idea. You have a question. Well, I wanted, I wanted to just mention uh, in race cell bright. That's something that some of us have had suspicions about for a while. A lot of most of our return dates for court cases have been at this courthouse on Broadway where you go through two security checkpoints, one when you enter the building and another when you get up to the seventh floor where the, the courtroom is where our cases are heard. 
the first few weeks we were having return dates there, it was just a normal checkpoint to bring your phone in. All of a sudden, they started taking away cell phones and putting them back in the security room back here, and then you have to come get them back. And that sounds pretty much like what you were talking about, about dumping phones. Oh yeah, so a really important thing to note here is it sucks that phones are really expensive, right? They're like, if you buy like an iPhone or something, it's like a lot of money, right? If your electronic devices are taken from you, throw them away. That's a non-technical solution to a highly technical problem. And it's a serious, serious thing. So I've had d devices that were seized by me, uh, by, by the US government, uh, that were mine, and I just don't trust them anymore. And I just toss them, I get rid of them. Or like I do forensic analysis to see what was added to them, for example, which is a whole other story. And if you think, for example, that someone didn't just copy the contents of your phone, but all of a sudden your phone